Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the evening uh, Bible study Wednesday of uh, the Sunday Bible Church. Say hi to everybody on uh, Facebook Live, YouTube Live. Don't forget, you can get this later pre-recorded, saved on YouTube by going to Sunday Bible Church YouTube page. Uh, tonight's study is called the WGMP of God Part Two. We'll explain that in a moment. The W period, G period, M period. P period, and we'll get to that. But let's begin by reading 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 56. Blessed be the Lord that hath given rest unto his people Israel, according to all that he promised. There has not failed one word of all his good promise, which he promised by the hand of Moses, his servant. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for tonight, Lord. We thank you that we can open your word, Lord. We can hear the cries of your heart, Lord, and the promises of your heart to your people, what you offer us, Lord, if we but partake. We pray, Father, you give the winds a mighty voice and take this message to the four corners of the galaxies and beyond. And if not there, take it out to those who are listening online. And if not there, take it to those who are sitting in this church. And if not there, take it into my heart tonight, Lord. May thy Holy Spirit fill this study with your presence. In Jesus' name. Amen. So tonight, this new series, which we started last week, the WGMP of God, which stands for the wonderful, glorious, manifold promises of God. They are wonderful. They are many. And this study is part two. If you want to uh, hear part one, you can go to our YouTube page. But this particular study in the promises of God are directed to his bride, to his church, to Christians. And we're going to go over, not tonight, but in the next couple of weeks, 30 promises plus a bonus promise. So there'll be 31 when we end the study in a month or so. But anyway, this is a new series, which it seems like a simple one. You know, you might say, well, everybody's taught on the promises of God. Big deal. We've heard it a hundred times. But the, promise, the problem is, and I've said it before, is we take this study way too lightly and we flippantly throw out a bunch of promises to everyone out there. And when we do, because we are doing it, I totally believe incorrectly, we end up perverting and we end up confusing the gospel and we end up confusing the promises of God. And that cannot be. Now, the reason why I say this is, and a lot of people don't understand this, is that not every promise in the Bible from God is for you and I, the church today. Mm -hmm. And we need to stop this insane perversion of applying everything God says to everyone to you. And a lot of churches use it. Yeah. And they abuse it, and they do it to get you to give money. People, like, well, let's just say like it is. This is about money. And if you want to promise, they'll find one that fits yep. your condition. And it's dangerous. So I wanted to focus on the promises simply that were given to the church in the epistles. And we're going to get to that. And first I want to talk about, and let's refresh ourselves the word promise okay promise a promise according to the dictionary is an oral or written agreement to do or not do something a vow or God uses the term a covenant God makes covenant with his people and there are two types of these covenants or promises one is an unconditional promise meaning you get from one person what they promised you no matter what you do there is no conditions it's like God's unconditional love and then there's the other which is a conditional promise which means what that you only get this promise if you follow the certain protocols that God has laid out and then the next as we go about this the next biggest mistake when it comes to the promises of God is that pastors and teachers, like myself, 
we sadly make casualties of so many of the sheep by giving them promises that are not applied to them. And what happens is when they trust in a promise that does not come true, they do not blame the pastor. They do not blame the Bible teacher. They blame God. And that's a problem because God never made him a promise or this certain promise, yet they're told that there is a promise. And I keep on bringing up case in point, Psalm 91, which everyone threw around in 2020 when COVID came. Everybody said, just claim Psalm 91, you're covered. No sickness is going to come nigh your dwelling. So, so people say, okay, I'm getting sick. I'm just going to claim Psalm 91. Yeah. People got sick and people died. Well, either the Bible is a lie and God is a liar, or somebody is misusing a promise. And it's the latter, people. So you have to be careful with these promises. Again, you cannot apply all the promises in the Bible, be they conditional or unconditional, to everyone. Why? Why can't we do this? Well, A, because some promises are just for Israel. Some promises are for Israel past. Some promises are for Israel future. There are promises that God has made to Israel that haven't been fulfilled yet. They're coming. Some promises are for the enemies of Israel. And some promises are for the enemies of God and the enemies of the church. God has promises to them that you do this, you're going to get that. Some promises are just for the church, just for Christians. Some promises, and I, I know, and I tiptoe around this because people don't like when I say this, some promises are just for the apostles. A lot of people just take the promises that Jesus gave to the apostles and assume that every single one is also for the church. Are they? Got to be careful. Some promises are for the future, the future in time, and more on that later, and some promises were only for the past. Some promises in the Bible are only for one particular person in one particular place in a certain situation. Like when God was talking to, uh, to the prophet Ezekiel. You know, he's working with a particular person telling him something. Not necessarily that that applies to everyone else, too. But we like to take these things, that God has a great, wonderful plan for your life, a plan to prosper and not to be poor, but to be rich. And, well, see, I'm taking that. Well, that promise isn't to you. Okay, by application, you know, we can say God has good things, but not always people. An example of a promise that is, now there are some promises in the Bible that are for everybody, during every dispensation of time, no matter Jew, Gentile, Greek, atheist, agnostic, believer, Buddhist, Muslim, no matter what you are. And we talked about it last week in detail, and just quickly, today is in Genesis chapter 9, verses 8 to 16. God made a promise to all people for all time, forever and ever that he would never destroy the earth with a flood. Okay? In case you don't know it, do you know why God destroyed the earth with a flood? For the perversion of gross sins, which was the perversion of the sin of transhumanism. DNA manipulation. That's what was going on back there in Genesis chapter 6. And you know I've taught on that many times. That's what God was upset about. He doesn't like when Satan is messing with animals and humans and playing around with all this stuff. And what did God do? In that particular case, he gave us a reminder of his promise. Right? A covenant. A token. Which was what? A rainbow. Okay? See a lot of rainbows lately. But the only rainbow that matters is the one that God puts up in the sky Amen. after it rains, interestingly, right? And it's a reminder. You know what? And every time you see one, don't look at it as just, oh, yeah, okay, God's never going to destroy the earth with a flood. Look at it as that's a promise that God keeps his promises to you, too. 
The other day I was praying, I was in a you know, bad place, I was thinking, I was asking God, God some things, and as a matter of fact, I was at the racetrack, and I looked up, it's a beautiful bow in the sky. I said, hey God, thank you for that. I needed that little sign in the sky, okay? Now I know it's about you're never gonna destroy the earth with a flood, but it's also a promise that God keeps his promise. Even that he's going to always have a bow in the, in the air when it, after it rains, right? Isn't that cool? It's a funny how everybody gets so excited about those rainbows. They post them. Did you see the rainbow? How about did you see the creator who made the rainbow? Isn't that cool? Right? It's pretty cool. We got this big painted beautiful thing up there. But let's get back to our promise list to the church and note there are many, many promises to the church. And I just chose a few that we take for granted, but that we need to remember. So last week, I was going to bring you up to speed each week. Last week, we did these. Number one, God's promise for you and I, if you're a blood-bought child of the living God in faith in Jesus Christ, a promise of provision. And it might not seem like a big deal, but when times get hard, you're going to be grateful for the promise of provision. Philippians 4.19, But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus our Lord. But it's based upon what God possesses. What does he possess? Everything. Cattle on a thousand hills. God will supply our need, Christians only based upon his wealth, not ours. Meaning food, provision, and shelter. That's a good thing. Number two, we spoke about a promise to have the ability to persevere through all types of troubles. I don't think we realize how important that is. The fact that we're here tonight and those who are watching online are alive means you have persevered. And I know a lot of your stories. You have gone through a lot of things. Some people here have dealt with cancer, depression, through all kinds of things. Yeah. I've dealt with it. And you know what? You look back and you go, how did I make it? Because God gave us the promise of the ability to persevere when we shouldn't be. How many times do you say, no, I don't know how I made it through that, man? That was some hard. I don't know how I'm making it through today. It is the promise that God will help you persevere. Philippians 4, 12 and 13. Number three, a promise to never feel God's wrath. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ Christian, you will never see the wrath of God. The wrath of God went on his son instead of us. Meaning we have nothing to fear when we die, and we have nothing to fear on earth of God's coming wrath on the planet, because we won't be here for it. Romans 5, 8, 9 says, But God commended his love towards us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than now being justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath. Whose wrath? God's wrath. Through him, through Jesus Christ. So that's where we left off last week. And we're going to pick up where we left off. But I also want to, uh, I'm going to be modifying this study each week. And what I'm going to do at the end of the study, right before we end, I'm going to show you a news clip or a video clip. Because I want to intertwine, and this is pretty exciting that I've been saving these as they've been coming up. Do you know the promises of God are being fulfilled in our lifetime? You watch the news and the promises are being fulfilled. If God makes a promise, even if it's for something that bad is going to happen, and it happens, you can go, well, God said that was going to happen. Wow, that's incredible. That means the promises to me are also going to happen. And we're going to start tonight at the end. And the reason why I, I wanted to put them in the beginning, but... Between YouTube and Facebook, they might cut us, cut our feeds or anything, especially when we get to really politically charged news things. Uh, they might cut us, have they done before. So we're going to do that each week at the end of the study because 
all of God's promises are important, and it's fun to watch them in real time, right? In real life. Promises that if we obey God's word, okay, we're going to be okay. And promises to the world that if they don't, they're not going to be okay. I don't know how the world is functioning right. Well, I, to be honest with you, they're not. They're coming apart at the seams because every institution and everything they trusted in is not working. And they don't know what to do. And what's interesting, did you see the latest poll that was just taken that belief in God in the United States, just in the news, I'm going to show that in a couple of weeks, is at the all-time low in the United States. And you would think everybody would be, nope. Matter of fact, the Bible says in the last days, the world, with everything that's going bad, they're going to curse God. They're going to blame Him for everything. So I was surprised, wow, belief in God is at an all-time low. Well, connect the dots, people. You don't believe in God, you get no blessings from God. You get no favor. And everything that is goes right down the tubes. Without God, nothing works. But let's look at these promises because they are wonderful. Number four, a promise to never be separated from God's love no matter what. Romans 8, 38 through 39, you can turn there. And it was funny, I was listening, I, today I took a prayer drive, I did my hour prayer driving out east, and I was listening to some CDs, then I was listening to family radio, and uh, both the things I was lis listening to were talking about the promise of God's eternal security. Which is interesting that how many people don't believe that. But the Bible clearly teaches it. That once you are a child of God through faith in Jesus Christ. You are saved forever. Ever. There is nothing you can do to get yourself out of salvation. Nothing. No matter what you do. Because keep in mind, what got you saved was not your works. So how can your works get you unsaved. It was what Christ did. So in Romans 8, 38 and 39, the Apostle Paul, and you know, Paul was a very educated man, and he was a very well-spoken, a great orator, and uh, just, you know, he was trained by some really great rabbis. So when he speaks, he speaks very well. Uh, he, would be, he would be considered a white-collar work of the day. And Paul says, for I am persuaded. Paul likes that word persuaded. And what does the word persuaded mean? It means I have been fully convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt. No, there's no question. No question. Not one little bit. There's an interesting story that's popping to my head. I remember when I, before I got saved, before I was a Christian, uh, not, uh, this was actually after I became a Christian, a little bit later on. Uh, but years and years ago, I wasn't even a deacon in the church. It was just a regular person like you coming to the church. And I remember meeting with one of the elders, Ralph Brown, an old elder. He's still alive, right? Ralph, Ralph is still alive. Great man. And I remember talking to Ralph Brown. And I said, Brother, I said, uh, did, you, did you ever question any of this? As a new believer, sometimes you say, I wonder if all this stuff is really true. I don't know. I pray for this and it happens, and maybe it's just all chance. Maybe I'm making it up in my head. And, and I was curious, and I said, even for a second, did you ever, ever? He goes, not once. Not one single time. I said, really? Because in the beginning, I did have some times. But people, you have to get to the place. Where I am, like where I am now, there's no doubt. I, I don't even have. It's impossible that there is no God. You have to get to the point like Paul is. He is fully persuaded. You have to be fully persuaded. Matter of fact, if you're not, you're fully a fool. 
because there is a God, because there is a creation. And if there is a creation, there is a creator. And I was just dialoguing with a couple of people today on social media about that. That, you know, well, how do you know there is a God? Well, how do you know there is a builder? Okay, well, if you're sitting in a building, well, then it's pretty obvious that there's a builder. You know that. You get into a car, you know it just didn't materialize. You know there's a car maker. So if you're logical, are you logical? Yeah, I'm ready. Do you believe in logic? Yeah. Are you an intelligent person? Absolutely. Well, then if you apply that rule to everything else, you know, I, I've got a music stand here, okay? I see the music stand. I can conclude two things that millions and millions of years ago, the sands of time blew on, you know, you know, the amino acids of the earth and, and this thing formed, okay? Uh, and it happens to be really good at holding up paper, okay? And I can adjust it for where I want it to go. Uh, I think that just happened by accident, by evolution. No, that would be, that would be foolish. Wouldn't you say that's foolish? Well, how can I not look at this, right? So you have to be able to say, I am persuaded. You've got to start from there, people. Paul was persuaded. He goes, I am persuaded. About what? And this is a great thing. This is, if you got your own Bibles, you've got to highlight these. Put arrows and stars and read it with this power. Remember, these words, they're not just words in the book. They are Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is this word. It's the mind of Christ. When you read it, did you ever notice you can read the Bible over and over? I mean, I read the Bible every year. I go through the whole thing, me and my wife. And you can read the same scripture. You know what's interesting? We can read, if you were on an island, right, and all you had was one Bible verse, you could read it every single day, and it would be a lie. We can read Romans 8, 38, and 39 for the rest of our lives. And we can never say, okay, I did that, let's move on to something else. No. What's up with this word? It is living. It is piercing. It touches the deepest part of our souls. And we don't know why until you know the one who wrote it. Just listen to it. For I am persuaded that neither death. Now, that's a, he starts out with the big one. What's, people, what's everybody really afraid of. I tell you, if there's one thing these last three years have brought to the head, we all know there's no hiding it. What really changes everything? We are afraid of dying. And all of a sudden, the possibility, because we always thought we weren't going to die. But I'll die when I'm 95. All of a sudden, because of the sickness, I can die at any time. And that scares me. Why does it scare you? Because I'm afraid to die. Hey, I posted this question. And this is very, this is very deep. And if you get this wrong, you really don't get it. Spurgeon said this. The greatest, what is the greatest day in a Christian's life? The day he dies. If that isn't the greatest day, then you don't really understand. Because what happens when you die? Absent from the body, present with the Lord. If you're not excited about seeing the eyes, looking into the eyes of your Creator, and I was thinking about that. Wow, how many people will say, well, I thought the best part of a Christian life is when I got all the fever and everything that I wanted, and a good life now, and the girl and the guy that I wanted. Well, those were all great. But if that's the best thing, in your Christian life, then your Christian life is a fallacy. It's faulty. Because what is it all about? That death doesn't affect us. We're not afraid of it. I mean, I'm afraid of, you know what I am afraid of? Dying painfully. I don't want to die painfully. And I don't want a loved one to die. You know why? Because I'm selfish. I don't want to be without them. I'll be honest with you. But of myself, I have no fear of that at all. I, I really don't. I look forward to I look forward to the day when God calls me home. Because only He can do that. So look what Paul says. For I am persuaded that neither death, 
nor life, and this is interesting, nor angels, nor principalities, high powers, those in, in high power, nor powers, those in heavenly powers, nor things present, things that you're going through, things to come, things that are coming in the future that we don't know about, nor high, high things, depth, deep, horrible things, nor any other creature. Other creature? What would that mean? Are there other celestial and terrestrial beings, possibly, that can be trying to do you harm? Paul is alluding that possibly there is. Nor any other creature, and here it is, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You can't get God to hate you. You can't. It's impossible. No matter what you do, no matter how you let him down, even the Bible says once you're saved and you're sealed into the day of redemption, even if you deny him and he abides faithful, he cannot deny himself. You can curse God. Say, I'm tired of this. I'm tired of you, God. Take the Bible. I know many Christians who have. I think I threw this Bible once. Ah! God says, you can do whatever you want. I love you. You can never sin your way out of my love. Because you can never, you know, be good to get yourself into my love. I loved you even before you were good. I loved you when you were dead in your sins. I love you. I'm not going to stop loving you. And I'm like, really? Yeah, really. Think about your children. Is there anything you... Now, you might not like your children. You might be really angry at your children. You might want to punch them in the nose or give them a curly poke in the eye and like that, but you will never stop loving them. Is there anything they can do? Even your kids... Did you hear that, that uh, Elon Musk, his daughter, is going to disown him? She's changed her name. She's, she's a nut to do that. She's going to change her name because I don't want to get into why she is. Uh, well, she can change her name to whatever she wants, but is that going to change that she's the daughter of that man? People, you can say, I'm not going to be Mr. Bill or Mr. Bill Smith anymore. No, I'm going to change my name to Bill Jones. doesn't matter if your father was... Bill was Smith. You're a Smith. It's in your blood. And if you're a child of God, purchased by God with his blood, do you think that your sin can outweigh his blood power? No way. And that's what Paul is saying. Nothing, even death. And it's interesting, Paul says, I am persuaded that neither death nor life. Well, how can life? Well, the life can be really hard. Life can be really stinky sometimes. And it makes you want to scream, but God says, even in the worst of life, it's not separating you from my love. Number five, a promise that God will come back for us to rescue us. Okay? That is a great, great promise. And we're going to talk about that at the end of the study tonight. That we will not Go through the great tribulation. I have this thing. You know, I've been really trying to avoid any, I haven't for years, Bible discussions on social media because it's just a fruitless thing and everybody jumps on it. So, but I was just so, I was in really a very, I don't know, talkative mood today. It was something on my heart. And I posted and I said, how can you be a pastor and a teacher of the Word of God. And when I started with eschatology, eschatology is the teaching of future things that the Bible is filled up. And I said, eschatology, why aren't we as pastors and teachers screaming this stuff from the pulpit unless you're more concerned about your kingdom here than God's kingdom come? And I said, woe unto you who do not and people started jumping up. Well, you know, you know we, we got to stick with the gospel because it, you know, all that stuff scares people and scares people. It's great news. 
And, and I ended up telling people, listen, well, well it's, it's all confusing. Everybody has different takes. No, there's only one take. There's only one truth. And then I said, you cannot separate the gospel from eschatology. And you can't separate eschatology from the gospel. Jesus is eschatology. What happened in Matthew 24 when the apostles say, Jesus, what happened? Like, when's going to be the end of the age? Well, how do we know? He said, well, that's the controversial. I don't want to talk about it. It's going to get people upset. It's going to scare them. He told them. And he says, but be not troubled when you see these things. Because if you're in God's, if you're in God's ship, if you're on in, in His bus, you have nothing to be concerned about. I don't know why people are afraid to talk about these things. It's great news. And what's the news? God always comes back. He always comes back. Did you ever watch? You know, like around Christmas time, uh, there was this one. I mean, isn't it funny? Every Hallmark movie, they're all the same. <laughs> They got the same story every time. And I was watching this country, a Walmart country Christmas about this girl that she was in love with this guy and he became a uh, famous country western singer. And, and he, you like that one? And he went away and, and, and he was supposed to come home that night and the girl waited and waited and he never came home and she swore I will hate that man for the rest of my life. And then he comes back to the town. And, and what was her thing? You promised you would come back for me, and you never did. I'll never forgive you. God made a promise. He goes, as you see me, have seen me left, you'll see me return. That's a promise. And it's interesting, people are like, they're upset about Jesus coming back. Why would you be upset unless you don't know him? You should be excited. That's a promise. And it's found in one place, 1 Thessalonians, let's go there. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, 17, and 18. And look at what this says. And it was, it was interesting, the dialogue that I had to explain to some people because they said, no, we've got to stay away from that stuff. We can't talk about those things. Just keep it that Jesus will give you a good life, the gospel, and all that stuff, and save you from your sins. That's it. And I said, absolutely not. And the scriptures are clear. In 1 Thessalonians 4.16, it says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. This is all in the future. It hasn't happened yet. With the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. All those who are believers who died in the past, all your relatives and family in Christ, they're going to rise first. Then we which are alive, the Christians who are alive during this time period and remain will be caught up together with those who, who died in the past in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Now this is a meeting. It's kind of a halfway return of Jesus. It's not the second coming. Jesus comes halfway down. We go halfway up. And we will meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Isn't that great? Well, how do I know it's great? Look at verse 18. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. But the people who are, who are arguing with me, no, we don't want to hear about eschatology. We can't talk about it because that's scary. How is that scary when Paul says, comfort one another? That whatever's going on in the world, no matter how bad your life is, God comes back. He keeps a promise. Number six, a promise of the gift of eternal life with God. Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death. That's the problem. We're all separated by, from God because of our sin forever. But, and there's that word. Remember a couple of weeks ago we did that study, but God, but God, the but it always separates the bad from the good. It's, it's the conjunction that, that when you have, you know, like, gee, I got a flat tire today, but it kept me from getting into an accident down the road. God always does this. Romans 6.23, for the wages, the, pen, the punishment of sin, which we all have, is death. And that's talking about eternal, e 
eternally dead, spiritually dead for all eternity. But, and look at the gift, the gift, is my gift. I, I always keep gifts here. The gift of God is Jesus Christ here, my child, for you. What do you have to do? Take it. Well, the problem is a lot of people take it and just kind of keep it back here. I ain't opening up this thing, no. God says, well, you're going to open it. Because then you're just a Christian by name only. You haven't looked inside. Because when you look inside, you know what it's in there? Forgiveness. God's love. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Meaning eternal life with Him. That's a good thing. You will be forever and ever with God when you die. And that's why, yeah, we hate funerals, especially for young people. I, I don't want to do those. But what eases the pain? If you've ever been to a Christian, I, I remember in my old job, my old boss, you know, he went to his first Christian funeral. Boy, I never saw people so happy at a funeral. Well, why are they so happy for? Well, they're happy. Because that person is not just laying there, gone. Okay? And they know it. They know that person is a believer. They know they will see them again. But yeah, they mourn because we love that person. If I lost someone that I love, I'm going to cry. I'm going to break down. Trust me. But not like those who have no hope because we will be reunited. That person is not gone. Okay? They are just not here. Whenever I do a funeral, and if you guys have been to the funerals I've done, I always say this. I always speak of the person in present tense. I never say when we do the eulogy, you know, Bill, you know, he was once, you know, he was once a great guy, he was once a great mechanic. No, Bill is. Bill still is. He hasn't stopped being Bill. Matter of fact, he's more Bill than he's ever been before. He still is. He didn't cease to exist. He just changed locations. He's at a place that you can't visit. And if you want to go there, you got to get a ticket. And the ticket is in this box. Okay? And it's the blood of Jesus Christ to get you, get you in. So you can be with your loved ones to be reunited again. A promise of eternal life with God. Number seven. A promise of salvation not based on how good we are. Meaning my goodness doesn't determine God's love and salvation. And you know, I, I've spent so much time with so many people with this. And it's so hard for them to get that in their head. And they'll say, you know, but you don't understand what I've done. But you don't understand. I don't think I'm good enough. I mean, I remember this one young lady. And every once in a while, you'll you run into people like this. And, and I found out she was going from church to church doing the same thing. And, you know, getting saved like 80 times. You know, just, I, I don't think I'm really a Christian. I don't think I'm really a Christian. And I said, what's, what's wrong? Well, I got all these sins. I said, well, confess them. And that's done. She do it. She must have said, you know, ask Jesus into her heart, which I, I told you guys. The whole asking Jesus into your heart is not a scriptural thing. You've got to stop doing that. It's trusting in what Christ did, calling out for him and his mercy and his grace. If you cry out, he will hear you. Okay? Repent and turn from your sins and trust. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? But she would just, I don't think I'm saved. And she, and to this day, last time I was so frustrated to sit and meet with her week after week and just I don't know if I'm saved. I think I'm going to go to hell when I die. And the torture this person went to because they didn't think they could be forgiven. But what is Ephesians? Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8. Paul says for by grace, and I know this is, if you don't have this written in your Bible, this is an important Christian doctrine to write down. This is a big one, Ephesians 2 8. For by grace are you saved through faith, that, 
and that not of yourselves, there it is again, it is the gift of God. Let me ask you guys a question. Do you pay for a gift? If you pay for a gift, it's no longer a gift. On Christmas morning, if someone goes, I've got a lot of you out of this box here. Yeah. If someone goes, Merry Christmas, and you say, how much do I owe you for that? Okay? You say, no, it's a gift. No, I'm not going to pay for it. If you pay for it, what happens? Not a gift. And what does it do to the giver? Insults them. It insults them. And when we say, okay, God, well, thanks, but I have to be good to get into heaven. You're insulting God. God says, you can't. Because this is by grace. What's grace? It's the unmerited favor. God says, no, you don't deserve it, but I'm going to give it to you. And to make it clear, I'm going to call it a gift. You are given a gift of forgiveness. It's not based on, you know, works. How many, you know, how long have you been serving in church? And how long have you helped old ladies across the street? And how much money did you give to the poor? And how many charities have, you know, there are people who spend their whole lives saying, oh, I, you know, I'm, I'm supporting a kid in, in Istanbul, and I got a kid here, and I'm sending money. I got charities. They got all these charities, and they think. I mean, I'm not saying those are bad things, but they're not going to get you to heaven. Why? Because it says, for by grace are you saved. Through what? Faith. Faith in what God has said that you believe is true. And what did God say? That my son came to earth. I came to earth in the form of Jesus Christ. I died on the cross. I rose again on the third day. I took on all the penalties for all your sins on my son. Died. And remember, two things happened. When Christ died, okay, he paid for our sins. And when he rose, he defeated death. So two things happen at the cross. Our sins are paid for, and eternal life is granted. Death is no longer forever, okay? Death has been arrested, as they say with that song. Jesus rose. That's why it's important. That's why in the scripture it says, if Jesus didn't rise, this is a true thing. Even if, if Jesus came to earth, right, and, and he went to the cross and he did the miracles and he did all those things and he didn't rise from the dead, Paul says, if Christ did not rise, then you might as well take the Bible, throw it away, throw it away. It's all wasted. And he says, when we are still dead in our sins, we're finished, we're over, the gospel is nothing. And that's why what separates Jesus Christ from every religious figure? He's all the dead. only... They're all dead. Thank you, brother. Every single Buddha and, and Muhammad and all those guys, they're all dead. Only one defeated death and rose from the dead. Okay, rose from the grave. And if you doubt the resurrection, Lee Strobel, there's a great book, or he has a couple of great books. A quick thing, Lee Strobel was a uh, was a atheist reporter, I think, for like the Washington Post or one of those places. Chicago. What was it? Chicago. Chicago? And he was I'm probably gonna, this is the vague story I have. He was doing a story on proving that there is no God. And in his uh, attempt to prove there is no God, using real journalistic techniques, if you're going to prove a case like a detective, he found, wait a minute, everything proves there is a creator. I have this book. If you, if you have friends who are into big scientific words, they got big heads, and they're like, oh, I need to talk about DNA. We need to read a case for a creator. You want big words? Because an atheist was turned to Christ. And then he wrote a book for, called The Case for the Resurrection. You know, there is no doubt, historically, it's proven that Jesus was a real person, he lived. Hey, people, if Jesus isn't a real person, I say this all the time, why is our calendar 2022? That's a great way to start a comedy. Ask somebody, 
Why is it 2022? Ask somebody. Well, what do you mean? Well, what happened 2022 years ago? They're going to really, they are not going to know. You're saying, well, you know what happened? The guy who's really not important, everybody tells us, entered the earth. Time itself, BC and AC, or AD, are separated by the entrance of this person who's really not important. Did you know they changed, remember when you were in school, they used to call it BC was before Christ? You know, they changed it in the scientific books now because they could not stand Christ. So now it's BCE, before the common era. Okay? Yeah, yeah and, and it's an era by changing it. Okay? Jesus is real. He is real. And they know he's real. And he's coming back. A promise of salvation. Not based on how good we are. But uh, really based on how good God is. He's the only good one. Okay. Now we can get that clip ready. Now I'm going to show you a clip. Which is going to uh, back up our promise number five. That God comes back. And if you were here for my Revelation study, you knew I played this every night. <laughs> the one that's going to scare you. Okay? <laughs> and why isn't this good news? Why would we not want to share it? Now, this is going to be a clip talking about what's coming next in biblical prophecy, the rapture. People, when things get really bad, don't you want to be, if, if your house is on fire, don't you want someone to come and rescue you out there? And say, no, no, let's let me burn in here. Jesus says, my children, don't worry about the news, what's coming next, or what's happening, or what's going to happen in November. Everybody's afraid and riots. He goes, when the real bad stuff comes, I take you out. I take you out. Take you home. Wouldn't you, as a parent, if you knew your child was in, got abducted, wouldn't you go to rescue them? Or say, well, they have to deal with that. They got themselves into it. They're going to have to deal with it. No. You rescue them. Okay. Let's, let's uh, show up these lights first, Rich, and then we'll play this. And then make sure volume is nice and loud. Okay. There we go. Let's play that.
How come those other people were left behind? Weren't real believers. They thought they were. How many people are going to church, playing, you know, playing the church card, waving the church? Oh, I know. Oh, yeah. I'm, I belong to this church, to that church, to this denomination. I'm good to go. You know how many people, when that day comes, are going to be looking around and saying, "I wasn't taken." Why? Because God's going to say, "I never knew you. You never knew me." Wow. Okay. That's a scary thing. Christ says in that day, many will say to me, right? Oh, Father, haven't we not done many good deeds in your name and cast out demons and did all these supernatural things? And I will say unto them, I never knew you. Get behind me, you workers of iniquity. Can you imagine how many people believe that I was... There, will there be people who served faithfully as Sunday school superintendents and, and taught Sunday school for 40 years? And never knew Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Wow. But what's the promise? See, that isn't a punishment. That's a promise of something good. When, when the, and that's not now. That's in the future. But it could be at any minute. Jesus says, in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. How fa what's a twinkling of an eye? That's how fast. Blink your eye. God is going to, and that's how it's going to be. People are just going to be gone. So what does that mean? People, well, how about a pilot in an airplane, cars driving, people driving cars. They're just going to be gone. The cars are going to drive off into the streets. That's what the rapture of the church, what the Bible talks about. Oh, that's just ridiculous. Well, then the Bible's ridiculous. Throw the whole thing out. So what God says, he goes, when, when he says at the end of the, the church age, which I believe we're at right now, when it gets too bad and the sin and perversion is out of control and there's this craziness in the streets and it goes, God says, right before it gets really bad, my children are getting out of there. Because wouldn't you take your kids out? I would. Yeah. If you know they were in a school and there was a gunman, what happens? The parents run, get my kids. God says, I'm coming to get my kids. They ain't going to go through that. People, that's not, well, you can't talk about that. Well, that's good news. That's great news. Jesus comes back before it gets bad. Isn't that great? Yeah. Jesus comes back before it gets bad. I want to be on that bus, mm -hmm. right? Got my hand stamped. Remember you used to go to nightclubs when I was a kid? Get your hand stamped, eh? I can come in, my hand stamped. You know, try to go back the next night, see if it still worked. That's not the right stamp. You can't come in now. <laughs> so these things are promises too. That's a promise of God. And it's also a promise we can also look at it in by application. If you're going through a hard time, if you're going through a season of discouragement, God promises to not forget his children, right? I'm dealing with my son right now. My youngest son is down in North Carolina going through a hard time, really emotionally, anxiety, depression. My wife had to fly down there. She's there right now with it. What do we do? Go right down there. Got to take care of him. He's hurting. You drop everything. Yeah, God will drop everything. For you. But if you don't understand how much he loves you, if you don't understand how much he's invested, how much has God invested into you? His own son's blood. Okay? He didn't pay for you with, you know, green, you know, stamps, food stamps. He paid for you with the most precious thing there is, his own son's life. To prove to us... What do I got to do to prove to you people I love you? It's it's you know, it's an amazing thing. People say, you know, you Christians with all this stuff, you know, this we don't want it. What don't you want? Eternal life? Forgiveness? What do I have to give up? What do you have to give up? Nothing. God gave up everything. I don't understand why people, well, I do understand, try. I don't want anybody over me. No one's going to tell me what to do. But they'll blame God. God is telling everybody, people, you need me. Bad things are coming. Hell is real. You need me. 
And all you have to do is take this gift and you don't... No, I'm going to join a religion where I have to do a lot of good stuff and I have to give this and do this. I'm going to do it my way, like Frank Sinatra. I hope, for, I hope Frank Sinatra didn't do it his way. Because, right, remember that song? Because that song sent him right to hell. I remember I did it my way. I hope he did it God's way. Because your way is sending us right to hell, people. God's saying, I mean, you look at, can you imagine people, well, I didn't know. I mean, God said, you didn't know. It was too hard. I, I didn't want to trust him. What? What did you have to do? When I came to Christ, what did I do? Did I sign documents? Did I have to get my checkbook out? Well, okay, what do I got to give? No. God says, I've done all the work. Receive forgiveness. How can you not want that? I was just talking to my mom the other day, my uncle, my mom's only sibling, uh, devout atheist, a violent atheist to the core. And when he was dying, uh, it was like kind of, I mean, we were all really close. I love my uncle, my, my uncle Joe. Uh, he was a great guy, but, you know, we, we started to get saved. We became Christians. Boy, he didn't like that. He didn't like it at all. He, he was actually saying, why don't you stick with your old religion? Why do you got to go into this new thing for? It's not a new thing. It's the only thing. But I remember, and my mom could attest too, you know, I sent him some letters saying, Uncle Joe, I love you so much. Just accept Christ. Understand who he is. Tony was, tell your son, stop sending those things. So I did. And when he was on his deathbed, the proverbial deathbed, he's dying of all these things. It's one of those things, you, you know you're dying. Mm -hmm. He's dying. He knows he's dying. And I'm like, Uncle Joe, you don't know what you're going to face. Don't you even want it? No! I don't want it! You don't want to... Just he, and he said, "I'd be lying if I if I accepted something I don't believe." I said, "You have no idea. Rejection. I don't want it. I will die my way." And he did. Now, as I was talking to my mom, you know what's great about God's grace? Maybe in His pride, He didn't want to give us the satisfaction. But maybe when He hung up the phone, you went. Jesus, I love you. Forgive me for my sins. Damn, he's saved. Right, they don't know. Yeah, we don't know. don't know. So we'll never know who's in hell and who's in heaven. Only God knows. But it's such a simple thing. Just to say, forgive me, I'm a sinner. I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross. That's it. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall be saved. And the world is like so opposed. I don't want to know Why? Why? Well, I want to do it my way. And we look at the world and we can say, wow, that's really worked out great for you guys. <laughs> We've decided to do it your way. We've officially, and you know what? It's really been a great, exper uh, a great experiment of the ages. Because there's never been a time, this is really prophetic, in, in the time of human history that the entire world has really, you, in, in Unanimous function cast out God. We don't want him. Let's see what happens. Well, how's that been working for the whole planet? Not so good. And you would think a logical person would go, hey, this is not going well. None of this is working. Right? We were talking the other day at the men's meeting. When I was in school, Newfield High School, we had a rifle team. Every high school around here had rifle teams where we would compete. And, you know, kids in farm countries had rifles in the back of their pickups. They go to school. How come back in those days there were no school shootings or church shootings? What's the difference between then and now? Well, they believed in God. In country, they had a, it was a whole different world where you killing is wrong. Mm -hmm. they, it's a bad now. It's like they don't, if you don't know killing, well, how come we don't know killing is wrong? Because there is no God. The Ten Commandments have been removed. 
Remember, it was a big thing a couple of years ago. They, were, they had the big cranes and the jackhammers pulling them off of every monument, the Ten Commandments around our country. They removed the law of God. Thou shalt not kill. And, and people can rightly say, a young person can say, who says I can't kill? And you can say, you're right. Who says you can't kill? Because if there is no law, there is no God, you're absolutely free to do whatever you want then. And they have a right to do that. And we see what happens. In public school, they read the Bible. Like yeah, I mean, back when you were a kid, they you read prayers in the morning, and you you know, and you and you read a scripture, and everybody and nobody was offended, and everybody had a moment of silent prayer, yeah. and uh, we seemed to make it. You know, it wasn't perfect, but it was better. You know, but I don't know. God knows. Let's just uh, bow our heads, and we will uh, come back next week and continue. Father in heaven, Lord, oh, we just come before you, Lord. Sometimes we look and we shake, go, wow, it's so clear. Well, but sometimes even in our own life, we say it's so clear. Oh, it is so clear, but we do the wrong thing. How many times I know that I shouldn't probably do that, and I do it anyway. I know it's wrong. I did it anyway. And it was clear as day, and I got a smack on my hiney from you, Lord. Not because you're a bad God, but because you're a good God. And you said, my child, I told you, that's going to hurt you. Don't do that. Yes, so we forget to. But I am so grateful that my sin now, because of Christ, can never be held against me. Because it was held against you. My sin was held against your son. He pays the price. I get set free. Who doesn't want that? It's a win-win situation. It's so simple. There's no religion. There's no, I have to do this. I have to do that. I got to wear a special hat. I got to spin around three times on Friday. I'm not going to do any of those things. You have done it all. And you offer it all. And you're a good, loving father who wants to spare his creation. We thank you, Lord, for your promises. They are great. We are a blessed people. What a great thing to know. That you love us and, and we love you. It's a great family. And everyone's welcome to join. No one's going to be uh, have any prejudice against you. Red, yellow, black, and white. As the song goes, we're all precious in his sight. As the little simple song in Sunday school, solve all the problems. Uh, help us, Lord. And help us to remember your promises. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you.